welcome. Welcome to Heart of Life today. Uh, my name's Jeff. I'm excited to be able to share some of God's Word with you today. Uh, thank you for taking the time to gather with us. Um, we are in a series that we chose to call What's That Mean? And really what this has been about is we have used some questionable memes about Jesus in order to drive us to the Bible where we find the truth of who Jesus is. And then our question every week has been, how does that then affect how we live? And so today, the topic, I believe, is one that is just right on time for us as a church. And the reason that I say it that way is that right now, Heart of Life is feeling because we are being incredibly blessed. We are. We're being incredibly blessed right now. And I think for the most part, we're feeling incredibly blessed right now. A lot of times, the summer, I think, in people's minds is sort of that, is just sort of that transition time of the year, right, where sometimes not a whole lot of stuff is going on because everybody's on the move. But this summer, how about all the baptisms we have celebrated over this summer? Do you realize how many that's been? I mean, it's felt like we've celebrated baptisms on more Sundays than we didn't throughout the summer. We are right now seeing some opportunities begin to open up on the international side of the mission connections that we have with other countries, that those are there really some new doors that are opening up there that I'll be able to share with you um, before long in, in more detail, but that's happening. Um, we are seeing this summer lots and lots of new relationships with people who are choosing to, for some of them, check out church for the first time and therefore checking out who Jesus is for the first time. We are currently um, in Harrisonville at capacity. And so that's... <clears throat> began the gathering there about a month ago. Every week has been at capacity, and so we are currently underway trying to figure out how to add another gathering there <clears throat> on Saturday night, All right? That'll be the first time we've ever done that as Heart of Life, to have uh, something on Saturday night. So here's, here's my point. Right now in the life of our church, we are looking at like taking next steps. It's just constantly taking next steps and trying to figure out, hey, what's the best thing to do here? And how do we go about doing that the best way that we can? Right now, the words continually that come to my mind are organizing and strategizing, right? Just all of that going on right now. And what I have learned over the years is that in seasons of being blessed that way, there is a tendency in the middle of that to forget something critical. Prayer. Prayer. Y'all, all of our organizing and strategizing doesn't carry much power. But prayer is a different story. But when it comes to prayer, I, I love the fact that people have lots of questions. Um, I have found that prayer is one of those topics that people who don't even know who Jesus is, they'll have a conversation with you about prayer. It's, a, it's an interesting fact, but lots of questions that we have. And so since we're in the meme series, I thought we'd start with a couple of memes. And one of them I'm just going to bring back from last week, all right? I, I showed this one, teased you this one last week, right? It reads, I, I, Jesus says, I already told you, I'm not turning your water into pumpkin spice latte. I like that. So again, it gives us this moment to kind of laugh, right? And, and, and it's like, but here's the real question. Okay, 
how do we really know what to ask for though? I mean, I know this is kind of being silly, but how do you actually know what to ask for? What, what's okay to ask for when it comes to prayer? Let me give you another one. Hmm. Prayer, because I already know what you want. I just want to hear you beg for it. Now, it's like we kind of smile when we hear it, and then we're kind of ouch when we hear it. And then, come on, if we're really honest and, and if we wanted to be, we could. there have been maybe some times in your life where you're like, is that what's going on here? Like, how does all that work together? How, how does this prayer thing work if he really does know what I need before I ask it? But how does it all work together? And so today, really, the question that I'm bringing is, in light of what we have learned about Jesus in this series, how should that affect how we pray? All right? In light of the truth that we've learned about Jesus in this series, how should that affect how we pray? And there is a principle of God that I think has helped me more than anything else in understanding this realm of prayer and helping me to wrestle with the questions that I sometimes have there. It's a principle that you've actually already seen in this series because we find it in Colossians chapter 1. And so if you want to go in your Bible back to Colossians chapter 1, we've been there uh, every single week. You've already seen this principle. Today, I want to bring it to light for us, all right? So Colossians chapter 1, go to verse 16, and let's read this um, at least one more time in this series, all right? For in him... That's Jesus. All things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So here's the picture, all right? We've got a statement about Jesus here. First of all, that he he creates everything. He is the creator of all things, right? It all begins with him. It makes this statement that he is before all things so that we understand when we say that we create something, it usually means we take stuff and we rearrange it. But when God creates, there was nothing to take and rearrange. He was before all things. He creates everything out of nothing. But he's also the God who holds it all together. Literally, he is the sustainer of it all, the one who who holds it together. And then one more statement, it says that it's through him and it's for him. That word for is a, a Greek preposition, it's pronounced ice, and it simply means progress toward an object. Well, who is the object? It's Jesus, all right? And so you've got this picture, it's a circle. It's a circle that when it comes to creation, it is all from him, right? It all operates through him. And it's all for him. It is this circle, all right? He's the source. That's what the book of Genesis tells us. The last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, tells us he is the course of where everything is headed. So the next time somebody asks you, where is this world going? You know what the answer is? Jesus. Every knee is going to bow before him in the end. And in between, he is the force holding all together, right? The one who creates the attraction of the atom that keeps it from just flying apart. The one who who puts the gravitational pull in place of a universe. He is the one who holds it all together. He's the producer. He's the preserver. He is the purpose. There is this circle. Comes from him. Operates through him. And it's for him. You got it? The Apostle Paul is the one who pins this letter to the Colossians. But in the book of Romans, Paul actually condenses even that statement, but he says it again. 
And so today, I I want us to check out Romans chapter 11, verse 36. And I I want you to hear how he says it to the church there. Romans chapter 11, verse 36, for from him and through him and for him are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. You see it? You see it? For from him and through him and what? For him are all things. It's the same language. It's the same picture. It is this divine circle that we know to be true in creation. From him, through him, for him. But I'm also telling you, it is true in so much more than I think we realize. How about when it comes to your very salvation? All right? How about salvation? Where did that start? Him. Right? We love him because he what? First loved us. And y'all, that first loved us was long before a cross where he stretches out his arms and gives his life. I mean, the, the Bible gives us language of Christ died right before the foundations of the earth. This, this whole thing on the mind and the heart of God, even before creation is put into place, it's from him. It's through him. His sacrifice, a death on a cross, a perfect sacrifice that pays the price for my sin. It's from him, it's through him. And then why does he do that? That we would know him, that we could love him. It's for him. When it comes to salvation, there's the circle. It's also true with what we call sanctification. It's just kind of a long word that means growing, growing up, all right? When, when you meet Jesus, he opens that door. You walk into his kingdom, but then there is this being with him and he's changing my heart to look more like him, that my life would look more like him. Is that you? That, like, are you responsible for pulling off the Christian life? No. That's impossible for you. That starts with him. And that goes through him. It's obviously for him. One of the most powerful principles I ever learned is that holiness is not the way to Jesus. Jesus is the way to holiness. It's the circle. It's also true of something like stewardship, right? Stewardship in biblical terms just means we are managing what belongs to who? Him, right? That even something like generosity, when I, when I want to, to give to God and it is reminding me of my dependence on him, but come on, when I give of the resources that I have, let's say that I give an amount of money, right, to, to God and, and the kingdom and the work that's going on, where did that money come from? From him it's sort of like you know how on maybe your birthday or maybe it's Christmas or whatever it might be and your little child gives you as the parent a present and you go where did that money come from you you y'all that's the way it is with God It is this circle that when it comes to stewardship, it is from him, it is through him, and it is to him. I'll give you one more. Serving is the same way. When we think about serving, right, and and we get all wrapped in what would it, but the scripture says that we, we are a part of good works that God has prepared in advance. It comes from him. How do we actually pull off the serving that we do? We are empowered by his spirit with gifts right? That, that, that it is his power at work within us. It's, it's through him. And then why do we do those? He says, so that they will see your good deeds and glorify Father in heaven. It's the circle. It comes from him and through him and for him. 
You're like, that's really cool, Jeff, but I thought we were going to talk about prayer. We are. Because guess what? The same divine circle that's true of creation and salvation and sanctification and stewardship and serving, it's also true of prayer. And that's what I want you to see today. And all the questions that we have about prayer, it, I want you to see the circle. And so I'm going to give you a few statements. Here's the first one. I want to encourage you to write them down, all right? Write them down, one, because you encourage me when you write something down. It makes me think that you, you really care about it, all right? Because I want you to care about it. Because come on, if we get this, man, this just changes how you live. Here's the first statement. The origin of effective prayer roots in the purpose of God. It is from him. The origin, right? This begins. The origin of effective prayer roots in the purpose of God. We could say it this way. Your desire, right, is that we often say your desire is that your prayers reach heaven. Can I tell you that the prayer that gets to heaven starts in heaven? It does. When Jesus' disciples one day asked him to teach them how to pray, right, you're familiar most likely with his response. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to read part of it to you, all right? Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, this is how Jesus begins the talk. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. Prayer is not, Jesus is saying, our way of getting our way. It is rather our way of wanting his way. We are simply closing the circle, right? Because it starts, it finishes, and it is carried out through him. When, when it makes that statement that he knows what you need before you ask it, isn't it funny how we read that? I know it's funny how I have read that for most of my life. We, we, he knows what you need. And we kind of walk away from that going, how good of a God who, who knows all things and therefore he is the God who can read my mind and he knows what I need even before I ask it. The implication being, like, he already cares about what I'm going to ask for. He already knows what I'm going to ask for. He's already gone to work on what I'm going to ask for. I'm saying, I think for much of my life, I was a little bit off on that. Because you know where the focus is on what I'm asking for. He knows even before I ask. But I don't know about you, but there's been like that one time or two that what I was asking for was off. The biggest truth is not the what I'm asking for. The most significant piece of that is he knows what I need. He knows. And so how, how cool of it how cool is it that God is going to invite us into this whole prayer thing? I mean, what is this? We are working with him to run the universe. Seriously. We are working with him right now in what he desires to happen on this planet. And he calls us in, right, to, to work with him. We see it from the garden in the very beginning and what they manage. And, and, and when you read the scripture one day, Right For those who are faithful with little, there is going to be an oversight on your part that runs much more than just the little territories that we think of now. 
It's kind of like, though, if you, if you got to, let's say you got to go on a, take a flight. Let's, let's, call it, um, let's call it a private flight because we get to imagine, so let's make it as good as we can, all right? So it's a private flight that the pilot has invited you to be a part of. He lets you sit in the cockpit of that, of that plane, and there he sits. He's flying the plane. He's got his controls, and there in front of you is, is, is a set of controls, and he says to you, let's fly the plane. And you, you get to take hold of those, and you're flying the plane, right? Okay, let's not kid ourselves. Who's flying the plane? He would say, we would say, okay, he's flying the plane, but he's, he's inviting me to be a part. But here's, here's, the, here's my, you need the pilot. The pilot doesn't actually need you. You need the pilot. He doesn't actually need you. That's the principle, and that's how this, and yet you get to be a part of flying the plane. He has invited you into this most amazing life. And as we walk that out, there is a connection with him. There is this dependency upon him. He disciples us in that process. Sometimes he's disciplining us in that, disciplining us in that process because he loves us and he sees areas that may be hurting us and he, 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 he shows us. The point is, though, all that doesn't begin with you. It begins with him. And therefore, do not turn prayer into simply some name it and claim it exercise where you decide what you want from God and then just claim it, claim it, claim it, believing that he gives that to you. Don't do that. Because it starts with him. I heard the story a long time ago of a little boy who was overheard. He was praying Tokyo, 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 Tokyo. And somebody asked him, he's like, why are you praying, Lord, Tokyo, 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 Tokyo? He said, because I just finished my geography test and I really need God to make Tokyo the capital of France. Y'all, sometimes that's how we sound to God. Because you and I don't have all the right answers. Don't turn it into some name it and claim it thing as though you do. So thank God, prayer starts with him. It starts with with him. Second, not only is it true that the origin of effective prayer roots in the purpose of God from him, Paul says, but it is also true that the operation of effective prayer relies on the power of God. It is through him. The operation of effective prayer relies on the power of God. What does that mean? Well, I think there's quite a bit here. I'm just going to give you some of it today, but I think you got to start at the very beginning. You understand that it's God who gives us the very desire to even pray? Like this doesn't happen. How do we know that? Well, places like Romans chapter 3, verse 11 reads, There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. <laughs> Without him, you do not seek him. Right? Right? But what happens is he gives you new life, right? You are made a new creation. His spirit comes to dwell in you. And the next thing you know, he has given you this spirit that cries out, Heavenly Dad, Abba, Father. Where'd that come from? Him. Right? Because you didn't even have the desire to pray before, and all of a sudden, now you have this desire to call him your dad. It is because God is the one who gives you that desire. But not only does he give you the desire, but he gives us the direction. 
He gives us the direction in which we ought to pray, right? Philippians chapter 4, we know this verse, I think, probably pretty well. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. All needs. Powerful statement. The problem is sometimes I want things I don't need. And sometimes I need things I don't want. And so how cool that the the Bible says that the Spirit actually intercedes for us, right? That when we're praying and we don't even know what to pray for sometimes. We don't know how to pray. And it's not just that we don't know the words. It's like literally sometimes we don't know how to best pray for this. But the Spirit is interceding for us. Hmm. Let me give you a text that I think sometimes we get out of whack on. Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, when it comes to asking God and what we want to see him do. Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, it reads this way. Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's pretty cool. Door is open. You step into his kingdom. Here's the keys. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And man, I have seen this text taken, and just it immediately becomes this, well, this, this is what I want, and Scripture says that if I, if I say this is so here, then, then it, it's going to be so, and if I say this is not so, then it's not going to be so. And I challenge you to do the word study on this. You have access to it. You can look it up. The, the language here, the tense of the verbs that are used in this text, right? Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. The tense of that verb is literally will have been bound. Will have been. In other words, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. In other words, has already been bound in. Where does it start? Always, always. Long time ago, I was um, in my 20s when I first walked through a particular Bible study that just really was one of the formational shaping times in my life on understanding more about prayer and how we walk this out. A statement was made in that Bible study that goes like this. Find out what God's doing and join him. It starts with him. So find out what God's doing and join him. And oh my goodness, is that so much better than me coming up with a plan and asking God to bless my mess. Find out what he's doing and join him. And that's, that's what Matthew 16 is all about. He's like, he's like what, what I'm calling you to do on earth is what I have directed you from heaven. And so the things that will be or won't be is because that, that starts with him. How did Jesus do this? The model is so clear. John chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus himself, this is what he says, Jesus gave him his answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. And so he's modeling this picture. All of this is really a process, a picture of what in another place in the book of Romans is described when you and I put our life on the altar of God. And we say, God, all of me, I want to be all of yours. And what happens when your life is placed upon that altar, right? Our spiritual act of worship, he says there there is this transformation that happens, a renewing of your mind that you will know the will of God. That you will know the will of God. In other words, life on the altar 
a transformed mind and view to be able to see the things of heaven that he desires to be walked here on earth. He gives you the desire to pray. He gives you the direction to pray. He even gives you the dynamic to pray because, right, effective prayer requires faith. Well, where do you get that? Him. Come on, you and I are not the source of faith. We, we, we can't make ourselves believe. Romans 10, verse 17 says these words, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. And again, when you study those words, and I always challenge you to do that, that word hearing, it is the word rhema, and it means not just hearing words, but hearing God. It changes our whole perspective that so many times, come on, we, we step up and we, we want to have this conversation with God. We want this prayer to be effective, but it tends to start with, listen, Lord, your servant is speaking. And we forget that beautiful picture given to us way back in the Old Testament, right, of a, of a young man named Samuel who learned the better approach is, Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Because it's when we hear from him, that's where he gives us faith. The point God wants, he gives us the want to pray. He instructs us how to pray and even the faith to pray it. It only happens through him. So, from him, the origin, the origin of effective prayer roots in the purpose of God. It's from him. The operation of effective prayer relies on the power of God. It is through him. And then, you know, we just got one more. The object of effective prayer, the objective of effective prayer is the praise of God that it is for him. The objective of effective prayer is the praise of God. It's for him. Remember how... Verse 36, closed out, Romans chapter 11. Let's go back to it. From, for from him and through him, and here's where we are now, for him are all things to him be the glory forever. Like it's praise. It's on. Sometimes, sometimes the reason that our prayers may not be answered is that we are not really interested in the glory of God. <laughs> Let's just be honest. James, who you know, he's so to the point often. James chapter 4, verse 3 tackles this. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasure. And these lead us to tough questions like, come on, be honest, how much of what you ask for <laughs> is about God's glory? Like, really? Like, how often are you asking God for something, and does, he, does the question of his glory even come into play? H how much time do we spend praising him because typically the more time we're going to spend praising him for who he is means the more we're understanding this principle that this is supposed to be about his glory. This is, this is about his greatness. Like, come on, don't, does he care about what you need? Yes. Yes. His, his promise is that as long as you have life here, right, he's going to supply even those basic needs. That don't, don't write that off as though a God doesn't care. He just knows what the greatest reality is. It is himself. It is his glory. It is his greatness. It all points to him, from him, through him, for him. And when you, when you put this whole picture together, I believe this is the best way to define and describe what we call praying in Jesus' name. 
right? Now, we're familiar with that. I mean, typically, if you, if you hear somebody pray, they're typically going to pray in Jesus' name. Why do they do that, and what in the world does that mean? Well, real quick, check it out. John chapter 14, John chapter 14, verse 13. Jesus said, and I will do whatever you ask in my name. Ah, so that the Father may be, there it is, glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I'll do it. Now, come on, you've probably seen this happen. I definitely have. Where people will take the tagline (laughs) in Jesus' name and simply use it to try to be one of the check marks that in some way that if, I, if it's in Jesus' name, then he, will, he says he will give me whatever I ask for. But what does it mean in Jesus' name? I'm telling you, it means that you recognize when it comes to prayer and what you ask for, what you need, what you want, it is from him, it is through him, and it is for him. And when you are recognizing that defined circle, from him, through him, for him, all of that together is a picture of what it means to pray in Jesus' name. In his authority, in his power, that's the picture. You can ask God trusting that he knows what is best. So I want you to just hear me for a few minutes. We'll wrap this up. That means that I don't need to be more emotional, passionate to try to move God to give me what I want. Jeff, why would you say that? Because come on, that's the thing that gets done. Where it's like I'm praying for something, I'm praying for something, and I'm not yet seeing that thing done. And, and you know, it is actually a very common teaching in even the geographical area in which we are um, located that there is this sort of under the radar teaching that says the more passionate you will be about prayer, the more passionate you will be about praise and worship to him, the, the, the more you raise that bar, then you will see God give you what you want. That's, that's not what I'm reading from him, through him, for him. What we learn today also means I don't need to be more determined in believing in order to try to move God to give me what I want. Now, come on, faith matters. Don't, don't disregard what it, faith matters. God says without, without faith, we don't please him. But when you're praying, You need to be really careful that you don't dive into this pool that says, if you will just believe more, if you will just believe more, if you will just believe more and do not doubt. Whatever you do, do not doubt. Then God will answer. That's not in there. There is probably very... I know it. There's very few things in the life of the church that makes me more angry than when I hear somebody tell somebody else that. And often for me, the reason it gets told is often somebody is in the middle of hurt already. Like they're already wrestling with something that they really need God to do. It usually involves somebody that they love. Maybe somebody's sick and like, and somebody will tell them, oh, if you will just believe, 
if you will just have enough faith, if you will not doubt. And the problem is that's not true. And so sometimes not only does God not answer that prayer and they lose a person that they love, but then on top of it, they have to live with the guilt that I apparently didn't have enough faith and I wasn't a good enough prayer and I, I, didn't, I couldn't believe enough that I could save the person that I love. That so angers me when people hurt people who are already hurting with something that's just not true. It's not how you pray. How is it that we skip over all those beautiful stories that God was so clear to give us where prayers of faith go like this? God, we are asking you to because we believe that you are God and you can do all things, but even if you don't, we will trust How come we skip over those? And I know sometimes the reason is because we so badly want what we want. But in the meantime, we hurt people. We hurt people. What we learn today also means that I want you to be careful in the thinking that you need to try to be more holy to try to move God to give you what you want. What I mean by that is it's this belief that If I'm a good boy, then God will give me. The better person I am, then God will give me. I'll come back to that, but I got one more, and then I'm going to wrap it together. I want you to understand that the way we understand prayer today means that we don't need to be more aggressive in combating the enemy in order to get what we want. Because we just switched from talking to God to talking to the one who we claim is not our God. But I've heard it too many times where suddenly there is this switch and we're telling the enemy what he can and can't do. Look, you don't need to be focused on him. You don't need to be praying in fear of him. You don't need to declare to him what he can or cannot do. The truth is that he is no match for your king. I would encourage you to talk to your king and let your king deal with the enemy. Your king is what we call omnipotent. You know what that means? He is all powerful. Do you believe that about Jesus? Yes. Listen to me. Satan is not omnipotent. He's not all powerful. He may be more powerful than you and I, but he is not all powerful. He's not. He is not like God. Our God is omniscient. You know what that means? He, he's all-knowing. Our God knows everything about everything. He not only knows what I do and even what I do that nobody else sees, he also knows my thoughts and my motives. He knows all things. Listen to me. The enemy is not omniscient. He does not know all things. He does not know everything about you and what you think. He does not. He does not. Our God is omnipresent. Means he is all, he's everywhere, right? Everywhere. Eternity, past, future, he is everywhere. And the enemy is not omnipresent. Sometimes when I hear people talking and praying and it's like we're praying, telling the enemy, telling Satan to stop, I don't think he's there most of the time. I don't, now, I do believe in demons. I believe in an angelic force. I believe that there are demons who really are at work in our world. I, the scripture describes that. But most people who think they're dealing with Satan, I do not think most of us have ever dealt with him. He cannot be everywhere <laughs> at once. He is not like God in that way. And most of us, and I'm including myself, 
are probably not living dangerous enough for the kingdom that, right, he himself. I'm just saying, there are demons at work, but most of the time when we address Satan, right, which I encourage you not to do, he ain't, he's not there. He's not. I'm not saying he's not at work. I'm not saying there aren't forces that are battling. That battle's real. But come on, talk to your king. Talk to your king where prayer comes from him and through him, and it's for him. Does God want you to be holy? Yes. Does he want you to grow in holiness? Yes. Does God want you to have faith? Yes. Does he want you to grow in your faith? Yes. Does God want you to fight the the warfare that is around you? Yes. Does he want you to do that better and better all the time? Yes. Does he want you to be passionate, right, about this love that you have for him? Does does he want there to be an emotion that, that comes with this life and knowing Jesus just like it would when you know others that you love so very much? Yes. The answer to all of that, yes. He wants you to be holy and believe and fight and be passionate, but be careful. Stop trying to use those things to manipulate God to give you what you want. Answered prayer is about God's grace. From him, through him, for him. You can trust what he wants for you. And there are many of us, even in this room today, who can testify to the fact that he can grow you in that to the place that you are even able to praise him even when you're currently walking through what you don't want. From him through him, for him. What should we do? How about we pray? So I just want to give you the chance to do that for a minute or so. And don't worry, if this is your first time today, nobody's going to put you on the spot. I'm not. Nobody's going to put you on the spot. No speeches you got to give right now or big, beautiful prayers out in front of everybody. You don't. I want you to be able to take a deep breath right now, wherever you may be seated right now, whether you're at home, whatever, just I want you to take a deep breath. And I want you to seize a moment to talk to God. And on that thing that's going on in your life, whatever it might be right now, all kinds of stuff we could come up with across this room, different, like it's the stuff that right now you're waking up in the morning and wrestling with. It's the stuff that before you go to sleep at night, you're like, I don't know how this is gonna go down. I don't know how this is gonna work. It's, It's that thing. I wanna encourage you to take just a few minutes and just rest in the truth you don't have to manipulate God in what needs to happen. He already loves you more than you can imagine. So instead of all that other stuff that we sometimes bring, I just want you to take a breath and I want you to just in a few moments with him, Listen. What does he want to say? What does he want to say? So listen. And then you talk to him. Be honest with him. It's okay. I promise you, he can take the biggest, baddest honesty you've got. You're struggling? Tell him. You don't like what you're dealing with? Tell him. But somewhere in that mix, ask him to help you trust. 
all right? Let's bow our head. Let's bow our heads across this place. And we're just going to give some moments to be quiet. And I just want to invite you to see him right there. He's here. And listen, what does he want to say to you? If there are things you want to say to him, I encourage you to say it to him, knowing that he hears. And I encourage you to ask him to help you to trust that he will give you what you need. Lord, together today as your people, we just want to simply say thank you so very much for a gift that you have given us in prayer. The fact that we can be connected to you, the creator and the sustainer, and the end of where all this is going. God, you allow us to be with you. And we ask you to forgive us, God, of those moments where, God, we we take this and we turn it into... uh, Really, although we never say we do, God, trying to get you to move in the way that we want you to move. Yeah, sometimes you tell us that the battle is long. Sometimes our prayer requires long seasons of being faithful and continuing to ask. But God, we don't have to convince you to be good. We don't have to convince you to do what is right. Will you help us to trust? God, especially in those moments when things don't make sense, in those moments where what we're asking for doesn't seem to be the answer, God, will you enable us to trust you, our God who is good? And even when it comes to prayer, it's from you, it's through you, and it's to you. We praise your great name. And it's in that name that we pray today. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen.